Take your Bible tonight, turn to John chapter 6, and hold your finger there. John chapter number 6. Tonight we're preaching another new message on the Castaway series. Tonight we're preaching on delivered sinners by God's grace will not be cast away. Delivered sinners by God's grace will not be cast away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the evening. Bless the message now as we look at the wonderful truths in your word. Father, we pray that if there's one here tonight that doesn't know you as their Savior, we pray that tonight they would invite you into their heart. Help me, Lord, as I speak now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The August 1st, 2011 issue of the Beaumont Enterprise records that in the month of October in 2004, Amene Barami spurned the marriage proposal of Majid Movahidai, who was a fellow student at the University of Tehran. In response to her rejection of him, Movahidai threw acid on her face, leaving her blind and disfigured. Under Sharia law, she appealed for similar retribution, and he was sentenced to have acid drops placed in his eyes so that he would likewise lose his sight, literally an eye for an eye. She endured 17 surgeries before the punishment was finally set to be carried out on July 31st, 2011. Officials determined that the court-ordered retribution should be broadcast on Iran's state television so that it would serve as a detriment against such crimes. As the doctor, however, was moving to carry out the procedure in the operating room, Baharami halted the process at the very last minute by asking the doctor to spare him. She said, I forgave him. I forgave him. And after that dramatic scene, the 31-year-old Baharami stated, it's best to pardon when you're in a position of power. That true story is a reminder of the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ who forgives the repentant sinner because he has the power to do so. Because of his saving grace, we will never be rejected by Jesus, even though we're just a bunch of sinners. Our salvation is in Him, and it's secure and complete because we are in Him when we put our faith in Him. As Christians, we do face the consequences of our sins, but our soul is eternally secure in Jesus Christ. And because of that, we will never be cast away by our Lord. Look at John 6, look at verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I, am come, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will. Okay, what is it? Which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Boy, don't you like that? 
And then he says, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The heartbeat of God the Father is that all sinners be saved by the grace of God. The process begins and ends in the Father's heart. God is reaching out and drawing all men and women to Himself, beloved. But unfortunately, not all sinners will draw near to Him and be saved. Because sinners do have a choice to accept Jesus or to reject Jesus Christ. Multitudes reject God's offer of salvation and His saving grace to their own demise for eternity. They have a choice, but they reject Him. Understand that God is not responsible for man's damnation. Men and women are responsible for their eternal destiny by the choice that they make about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the factor. If we were robots with no choice at all, what would be the purpose of Christ's ministry and the crucifixion? That does not make any sense at all, but what's unbelievable is there's a lot of people that believe that. God's choice to save man took place before the world was ever created. See, God chose a plan of salvation, which He accomplished in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what He chose. God's desire for our salvation is seen in Scripture. And it reveal, re, reveals that Jesus Christ did not die for just a select few people, but He died for the entire world. God does not choose some people to be saved and choose other people to be lost. He does not do this. This is not in the Bible at all. Such teaching is unscriptural, and not only that, it's unjust. To say that God chooses some to be saved and some to go to hell would contradict a number of passages in Scripture. God's offer of salvation is extended to the entire world, not a chosen few. Whoever believes in Him will be saved, the Bible says. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Oh, thank God for that. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heartbeat of God. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 1 Timothy 2.4 who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, the Bible says. John 3.15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hebrews 2.9 But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. See, it was God the Father that gave his Son for our salvation. That was His plan and His will. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John 4.10 Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation has the idea of a, an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Jesus spoke of doing God the Father's will, which was the redemption of mankind, of the human race. John 4, 34, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. God has put in our conscience the awareness of him, of his law, and of right and wrong that we might search Him out and be saved because of our own sinfulness. Romans 2.15 Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. God uses His creation to testify him of Himself and to reveal Himself to men so that mankind will trust in Him. In other words, who made all this stuff? This stuff is perfect. This just didn't blob together by accident. Anybody with a brain can figure that out. And that's when men begin to have that curiosity of seeking out the Lord. Creation leaves men without an excuse for not believing in Jesus Christ. That excuse is removed. Romans 1 verse 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God uses His blessings to lead a person to a point of repentance in his life. Romans 2.4 Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Oh my, He is so good to us. God uses even trials and heartaches to lead us to repentance and salvation if we do not know Him. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed with repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. God uses His Word and the Spirit of God to bring conviction and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Christians need to go to a Bible preaching church because that way the Lord can speak to them when the Word of God is preached in those churches. John 5, 39 says, Search the magazine. No, 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 no. It says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You want to know God? Get in His book. Uh, 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. John 16.7 Nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is expedient, expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, 
He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Oh, beloved, the souls of men and women are, that are touched by the Father's wooing, the Father's drawing, and His work in their hearts respond by believing in Jesus Christ when God touches them. And I still remember the day the Lord touched my heart. Man, I know. I mean, He hit me like a lead balloon, boy. And boy, somebody who was asleep, all of a sudden he was awake. God had touched my life. Those who make the choice to believe in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that person is saved by the grace of God right on the spot, wherever you are. No matter what country you're in, what room in your house, or even if you're in a 1963 Chevy truck by a lake in the middle of the woods in Canada, he'll save you there. You know what, if an astronaut went to the moon and landed on the moon and realized he needed to be saved after work, looking at the moon and the universe and the stars and the planet Earth, if he wanted to get saved on the moon, God would save him there. Thank God for that. You know, the Bible says those who, who trust in Christ, they belong to Jesus. They are given, get this, they're given by God the Father to Jesus. That's what he said. Jesus works in union with His Father and with the Holy Spirit in saving a soul that needs to be saved. They all work together. John 17, 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine, He says. 1 Corinthians three twenty three, And ye are Christ. And Christ is God. You are property of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you went to the store and had a t-shirt that said property of Jesus Christ, you would be telling the truth if you wore that t-shirt. If you know Christ, you belong to Him. You are His property. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul said this. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Why? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to the Lord, beloved, if you're a Christian here tonight. Because the Christian belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, he or she is eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Look at John 6, 37 again. Here's what, what it says. All that Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Notice that phrase, I will in no wise cast out. In the Greek language, a double negative is used for greater emphasis of what he just said here. God says, no, in no way, Jose, I'll just put that in there, okay, will I cast out. No, in no way will I cast out. That's what it's saying in the Greek. The security of our salvation, I knew you all liked that Jose there, okay. The security of our salvation is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. Notice he, we didn't earn it. He gave it to us. I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able, does that sound familiar? To keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We sang that in the song tonight in the chorus. Amen. Well, this is where it comes from. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5, Peter got in on this. Oh yeah, he said, who are kept by
by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be re revealed in the last time. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are kept by the power of God. Now, what does that mean? That word kept is derived from the word fruo, of which means this. It means to guard or protect by military guard. <laughs> you guess who's guarding us? The captain of our salvation. Amen. Uh, it means to keep by watching. Our lives are garrisoned by God, and He stands as the sentinel over us all of our days. Our salvation is under God's constant care and protection. I don't know about you, but that helps me sleep at night. Our salvation is through our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by any works or deeds that we do. The Lord saves us by our faith in Him, and He is the one, He is the one that keeps us saved. Good deeds or works do not maintain a person's salvation because they were not a factor in the first place. If deeds maintain salvation, how would you know if your deeds were good enough to maintain it? You would not. We are saved by God's grace and kept by God's grace. Salvation is the work, not of you. It is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation is kept or guarded by our Savior. Some mistakenly believe they can live any way they wish because they have been saved by grace. The, uh, there are folks that say, I'm under grace so I can live any way that I want God will forgive me later if I do something wrong. Now understand this, if you have been saved, you will not want to just live any old way. Oh, you're still going to struggle with that sin nature, but you're not going to want to do anything wrong. You're not going to have that desire. But there's going to have days you're going to do some stupid stuff. Amen. How many are in the stupid club? Raise your hand. We've all done that. You... The desire of the Christian, that desire is this. That person wants to please and to honor the Lord with his life and not to live wickedly, not live sinfully. Galatians 5.13, Paul put it this way. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve, serve one another. God broke the shackles of sin in our lives so that we could serve Him and minister to others. He gave us that liberty so we could help other people not live a wicked life. The liberty or freedom that we have in Jesus Christ is not to be used as an, as an excuse to live in sin, but to freely serve the Lord. Our freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ has been given to us by the Lord to serve Him and other people, not to indulge in iniquity. So Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means to be free to do as we ought. Peter addressed this issue because it was a problem in his day as it is even today. Some Christians were living carnal lives in Peter's day. Since they were saved by grace, they abused God's mercy and grace. They lived worldly lives. This is why the doctrine of eternal security is opposed by people today who believe that our salvation is maintained by our good works instead of God's grace. They complain that eternal security gives Christians a license to live any way that they want. But Peter makes it very clear, no, it doesn't give you a license to live any way you want. If you refute eternal security, and there are so many denominations that do, 
you might as well refute the doctrine of salvation by grace because it has the same effect. Salvation is all of God. It's all about Him, not you. We are saved by grace and we are maintained by grace. Listen, if you could lose your salvation by sinning, how many sins or what sins cause you to lose it? Realize any answer you give makes you the judge and not the Lord Jesus Christ. Your answer makes you a judge of what sins are bad and what sins are okay. None of them are okay at all. You wouldn't think that, buying, that eating some forbidden fruit would be so bad, but you know what? It costs the human race and the world to become cursed. The curse of death is on the human race because Adam ate that forbidden fruit. Thank God for His saving grace, His maintaining grace, and that He will not cast any Christian away from Him. Use your life to honor and to glorify Jesus Christ. You want an exciting life? and Make that the goal of your life. You'll find every day is in a new adventure. Use the freedom from the shackles of sin to help others and to be an influence for the Lord in the lives of people who need Him. You know, the August 7, 2007 issue of the Houston Chronicle stated that if you were to ask any baby boomer to convey the defining moment of their generation. Most would reflect upon November 22nd, 1963. The assassination of President Kennedy left an in, indelible mark on the United States of America. I mean, it shocked this country. And it shocked the boomers in particular. I still remember where I was. I was sitting in my first grade classroom at my desk. And the, Mr. Beamer, our principal, I loved him. He's a Christian man. He announced over the intercom, I think it was about 1.30 in the afternoon, that the president had been shot and was killed. It was like a holy hush in our classroom that day. I was eight seven or eight years old at that time. And I, I didn't know what to think, but I just I remember seeing our president on TV making speeches, but now he's dead. Somebody killed our president. But it shocked the entire country. That somber event, somber, a somber event carried immeasurable implications because John Kennedy, he had, he had risen to the highest level of government in the free world. He was a man of enormous influence, and he had enormous power. Everyone knew of JFK, but only a few would know the names of either Aaron Kumana or Bioko Gassa, and the significance of their influence in Kennedy's life. See, in 1943, these natives from the western Solomon Islands helped rescue the crew of PT-109. That was the boat that Kennedy was the captain of. And uh, that, that, that sh ship, that boat, was, was uh, hit by a Japanese destroyer in the middle of the night. And those guys were spread all over the Pacific Ocean. Lieutenant John Kennedy and those crew members survived the sinking of their ship by that destroyer. And what they did, they swam to a nearby island while clinging to pieces of wreckage of that plywood boat. Kumana and Gassa found the survivors and rowed them 35 miles through enemy waters to secure a rescue boat. Not until 2002 were these men formally recognized for their heroism. Gassa was given $15,000 
for a brand new house and a bronze statue of Kennedy. But Kumana, he was overlooked because he was believed to be dead. But in 2007, it was discovered that the 85-year-old islander was still alive. So he was honored by Navy Secretary Donald Winard. Six decades after aiding the future United States president, Winter declared, this is an individual who has had a very significant role in the history of our nation and in the world. He said that of that 85-year-old man. You know, sometimes it's the influence of the anonymous that literally changes the world. Whether you are well-known or unknown, Use your influence. Use your life to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. God help us all.